Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series, and I am happy to be back. And tonight we are going to be interviewing Mr. Damian Harmon. If you haven't noticed, we've been interviewing a lot of males lately because I think it's very, very important to not only highlight the women that are doing inspirational and great things in the community, but also making sure that we're highlighting our kings that are out in the community and doing exceptional work like Mr. Harmon with us tonight. Um, we're going to be talking to him about his different perspective and what that actually entails, what he does career-wise, and what it is that he is doing in the community, among many things. So I want to just very, very quickly say thank you to the all-male panel that we had this Friday on Juneteenth that was made up of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Commissioner Mark Jarrell, and I want to make sure I get the names right. So you're going to see me reading. Mr. Mark Jarrell, um, Brandon, Mr. Excitement Brown, Mr. C. Dwayne Hennett, Cedric Sanders, James J.T. Thompson, and also J. Locke, as well as Darrell Petway. All of these men talked to me on Friday evening about racism and social injustice and how they're talking to their children about these issues and what it is that they suggested that we can do as a community to fight racism and social injustice. So if you missed the special panel on Friday, please, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. It is an hour and a half. It's very informative, full of experience, full of candid conversation. And Mr. Mark Jarrell himself shares his personal experiences as well with dealing with racism, even as a councilman that has been elected by our community. So make sure that you check that out. I've done a couple of watch parties, but you can also find it on YouTube as well. If you look at the Speak Up and Inspire series, all male panel on racism and social injustice, but you can also find it on my page as well. And I also encourage you to share it not only with your family at home, but on your social media as well, so that other people can see the talks that I had with these amazing men and, the, and that are active in our community every single day, including Mr. Commissioner Mark Jarrell. So we are going to turn over to Mr. Damien. He is going to be on our mail panel as well that we have coming up soon that is gonna be talking about domestic violence. Um, it's very important for me as an advocate and also as a survivor to know that there are men out there who understand what domestic violence is, the effects of domestic violence and how they play a part in advocating against and fighting against domestic violence. Mr. Damien is going to be on that panel that we are planning in the near future. And so I wanted to make sure that we had him on the Speak Up Inspire series so that you can get to know him before the panel. So hello, Mr. Damien, how are you doing? I'm great. Good evening. How's everyone? How are you doing, Miss Tiffany? <laughs> I am doing very, very well. Happy Monday. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The start of a new week. I count Monday as like the start. Sunday yeah. is like the end. That's like the, the sun going down and the Monday is like the <laughs> start over. So, you know, yeah, yeah. great Monday. Yeah. Great Monday. Good, good. And I know that you're a father. So how was your father's day? It was awesome. It was actually, you know, um, I actually spent a lot of time with family uh, over the weekend. I had a lot of loss going on. So spending time with family, you know, having fun and getting laughs, you know, reconnecting. It, it was a really positive, you know, Father's Day for me. So shout out to my family that down there in South Carolina, Orangeburg, South Carolina, I'm always representing hometown. Um, we did an awesome job. Love them, love them, love them. Good, good. Um, I'm glad that you and your family are reconnecting. Um, I know that you suffered a tragedy a few weeks ago. I want to talk to you briefly about that later, not right now, but I'm very okay. glad that you guys are reconnecting um, and that you guys are, are healing together. Yes. Um, thank you for sharing that. that. That means a lot for you to share that with me. I appreciate that. Absolutely. No problem. So we're going to jump right in. Um, okay. Tell me what you do for your career. I'm a mental health therapist. We have so many acronyms, licensed <laughs> clinical mental health therapist or counselor, um, licensed professional counselor, which they recently changed that, but it's just easier to say licensed therapist or mental health counselor. 
Okay, nice. Now, um, I know that you know, because we talked about it, that I'm working on my master's now and going mm -hmm. into my internship to get licensed. And right. I remember in school, they had a conversation about, is, is there a difference between therapist and counselor? Because those things are, those terms are used interchangeably. Right. So do you have an opinion about, is there really a big difference? Because it sounds like um, you prefer therapists. I prefer therapist just because it sounds better. Um, counselor, there's different levels, I guess you would say, right. of counseling. You know, you have guidance counselors, you know, you have camp counselors, you know, you have all these different types of counselors that don't require necessarily a, a master's degree or a license. So right. when I'm thinking of therapist, I'm thinking of someone that's achieved a certain level of academics, um, whether that be a master's you know, in social work or mental health counseling or family and uh, couples counseling, things like that. They've achieved a certain level. So, I mean, I just, it just sounds more distinguished to me. I just keep yeah. it like that. That's okay. Something. Yeah. Okay. I like it. That's something for me to keep in mind because <laughs> yeah, I haven't really, haven't really made a decision, but I, I like that, um, that explanation of why you use it because you're right. There are a lot of counselors out there in different field and doing different things. So that right. makes a lot of sense. Definitely a lot of sense. Um, so for you, what is your specialty? Because I know that there is marriage and family, there's substance right. abuse. What, what is yours? Mine is mental health. Um, of course, I do a lot of individual um, counseling, family counseling, do a little bit of couples counseling as well as couples, married, you know, girlfriend, boyfriends, that type thing. So but basically, I'm, I'm more often than not do individual and family um, counseling it. and, you know, just understanding the family dynamics helps you to understand the individual. So I definitely like to incorporate, you know, the family, even if it's a child or if it's an adult, I like to incorporate all the, the areas within their life to kind of give me a sum of like who they are. So, yeah. Right. 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 Okay. Um, so your mental health counselor and what made you go into this field? Um, it's, that's actually a pretty straightforward, but not, um, I actually did a lot of peer mentorship, uh, um, when I was an undergrad at South Carolina state university, my, my aunt, she's, she was actually a social worker, she was the director of DSS and she provided me an opportunity to be a peer mentor for like middle schoolers and high schoolers while I was in college. And then upon graduating, you know, with my undergrad in business administration, which was totally different, right? Um, I moved to Charlotte in 2002 and I got back into the field of mental health while I was doing community-based services, you know, working in the community with at-risk youth, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the family and that was kind of a glass ceiling for me I couldn't really go any higher couldn't make any more money you know all those different types of things but I wanted to stay within this field because I saw you know from an environmental perspective how mental health how the environment kind of affects you know family dynamics and how we interact with each other in our relationships and things like that so what better way to gain further understanding than to go back to school. Um, and that next step was to become licensed, you know, and achieve my master's degree um, and do it that way. So um, when I first originally started um, doing case management and things like that within the mental health field, um, I never saw a black male therapist, anyone that looked like me, you know, providing counseling to more often than not, it was a black individual or a black family. You know, the areas that I worked in it was predominantly black. Um, and, you know, the, the first guy that I saw, his name was Dr. Kendall Jasper. Shout out to Dr. Jasper. He's a clinical psychologist. Um, and he brought a different perspective for me to mental health. Um, he brought a different swag, you know, a cool, uh, a different way of looking at it. Um, mm -hmm. He made me see that you don't have to be this square type dude, you know, with the hard bottoms and the sweater like, <laughs> you know, Mr. Rogers or something like that sitting in a chair, you know, talking to someone on the couch, you can bring who you are and be, a, be an individual because 
you know, when you're comfortable with yourself, then it makes it a whole lot easier to develop a therapeutic rapport with the people that you serve. When they know that you're comfortable, then they'll be a little bit more comfortable. So um, once I saw that, I was like, you know, that's what I want to do. And I kind of emulated, you know, myself after him or patting myself after him. Um, so definitely shout out to Dr. Kendall Jasper. Look him up, the doc and the dude. Um, he's on Facebook, Instagram, nice. all that good stuff. Nice. Yeah, I will um, definitely look him up. Maybe we can get him on here. Yeah. So <laughs> so so after that, it was it was kind of like you know once I discovered like my own niche, you know, um, and who who I was and being more self aware, you know, I, it was easy for me to kind of transform into you know, this particular type of person that you see today that I, I, that's my hashtag. I'm not your average therapist at all. Like I have a whole bunch of tattoos. I, I look like I'm from around the way, you know, so I'm able to connect, but I'm also able to dress up and do black tie events and all these different things. And I'm able to adapt to a lot of different situations. So um, I'm, I'm a little bit different. I call myself weird. It's cool. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, so you said that you have a niche. So what is what is your niche? Um, that that I'm I'm kind of like that again, like that guy is just from around the way. Um, I'm able to connect with a lot of different cultures, um, ethnicities. You know, I have a lot of clients. You know, from various backgrounds from you know, people that are on a higher level as far as social economic status to mm -hmm. poverty level that's, you know, belly scratching and surviving. And I can connect with, you know, with the, the highest and the lowest and everything in between um, just on the fact that I show empathy and I'm really passionate about, you know, us maintaining our mental health, especially in the African-American community. So I'm able to connect with my guys and everything like that and, and bring the best out of them and the most out of them and allow them to realize their full potential. And we don't necessarily just talk about, you know, sports right. or girls or something <laughs> like that. They get to actually dive into the underlying issues that we all um, experience throughout our lifetime. Nice, nice. Are the majority of your clients males, being that you're a male therapist? Um, surprisingly, no, but it's definitely increasing. Um, I definitely see a dramatic increase over, I would say the last maybe three to six months, mm -hmm. which is which is a huge kudos to out, you know, going out to all my black men and men in general that's actually seeking treatment and being able to process some of these things and being transparent and vulnerable in your emotions, which I mean, it definitely takes some courage, but once you're in there, you kind of understand that it's not what you thought it was. You know, right. you have this idea of therapy, like you're going to lay on the couch and the person is like sitting beside you talking about, you know, tell me about your childhood and we just write and stuff. And it's totally not like that. I wanted to make it, you know, relaxed environment and really <laughs> chill to where you can just open up and just be yourself. Gotcha. Gotcha. Are you noticing that there is an increase in um, minorities seeking mental health services? And then the second part to that would be, are you seeing more men that are acknowledging the importance of mental health? Um, I think definitely over, I would say over the past decade, you know, uh, us as African-Americans, we, we've had this stigma, you know, this long-term stigma of mental health. And I, I've seen it kind of, dissipate just a little bit we still have a stigma still um but it's definitely on the decline and i don't know if that's due to more of the celebrities and people that you see you know on tv that look like you that are actually talking about mental health on a regular basis whether that's taraji p henson whether that's Charlemagne, whether that's common you know whether that's kanye west and he's talking about his own mental health issues so so they're opening up channels you know, for it to be okay, not to be okay. So it, it's definitely been on the decline as far as, you know, the stigma. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Like, and I got this from Dr. Jasper as well. He said, like, they're making mental health sexy in a sense. Like <laughs> nowadays, it's more so, it's more so of a trend, if you know what I mean. Like everything is really trendy, you know, oh, I suffer from depression, oh, I suffer from, 
it, it, it's been here. You know, we just mask it for for a lot of different reasons, whether that's the stigma or the shame that's associated with it. And we cover that up with substance use or substance abuse or domestic violence or, you know, anything that you can think of that that gives us a negative outlook on life. Right, right. Those are some really good points. Very good yeah. points. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay. And don't laugh when I share it because you're probably going to laugh when you see it, when you see what I'm sharing. <laughs> All right. So can you see that? Is, oh yeah, you got my picture. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> okay, so when I asked you for photos for your uh -huh. interview, right. you sent me two pretty different photos, which I Absolutely. thought was was pretty awesome. So let's tell tell us about this. Tell us about this Damien right here. Oh man, <laughs> this is the the normal the normal guy that you would see Monday. Through Sunday, dressed. I got my, you know, my regular jeans and a t-shirt. You'll catch me with a hoodie on if it's cool enough outside. Right. Um, and sneakers. I'm, I'm really relaxed. I'm, and when I'm relaxed, I'm good. I'm feeling good. Nice. For the most nice. part. So, you know, I, I give, I give my personality in my pictures, and you know, uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to hide my tattoos. I, I'm my own business in a sense. I'm a brand, so. Like that's me. I'm the tatted therapist. I'm not your average therapist. So you know that's what I that's what I put out there. Nice. Okay. So this is the Damien that I know that I met, mm -hmm. and so this is another Damien. Now this is a, a, re a really really nice Damien right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we got this Damien yes. right here. Yes. Absolutely. Very nice. Very nice, yeah. sophisticated, and as you said, sexy. I don't see the tattoos, but I know they're there. So <laughs> tell us, tell us about this Damien right here. <laughs> this Damien is is still me. Um, again, I can adjust and adapt to to different situations. I can go to a black tie event, and I can go to a hole in the wall. You know, it just depends. Um, but this one is. I mean, I'm still chill. I'm still kind of relaxed, but I'm still cool in a sense to where it's you know easy i'm not i'm not stepping outside of myself you know in this picture it's still it's still me you right. know for people for people that know me you know i grew up in church so i was always i always had to dress up my mom kept me in church like eight <laughs> days a week it felt like you know um so i was always dressed up and in my undergraduate program in business we had to dress up at least once a week. We had to go to a symposium like every week. So we had to dress up. So I got used to dressing up and I didn't think nothing of it to, you know, put on put on a jacket or put on some slacks and a button up and, you know, and be cool. Right. Well, I love this. I love it. When you sent me the photos, I was like, whoa, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely wanted to show that you you know, you are multifaceted. You're definitely multicultural. And so the I, we named the, the interview tonight a different perspective. So I think we've right. kind of set the stage for that. So what right. is that different perspective? I you mean, know? overall, like, I mean, my different perspective is that there are multiple ways to look at any given situation. There are 360 degrees in a circle. So there are multiple ways that we can address or attack a situation. Not one way is just the only way. There, there are many ways to come up with a solution. My way may be different from yours. Doesn't mean that mine is right and yours is wrong or vice versa. It's just different. And because we're all unique and we're all individuals, we're going to think differently. And just because you think like me doesn't doesn't negate or invalidate, you know, your perspective for me. So just being able to gain a different perspective on that, you know, is kind of one of those things that kind of sticks out for me. Right. Um, I have a question that's um, been posted in the live, but I'm going to ask this question. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask this question first. Okay. But even though I think it just drifted away from me and just went away that quickly. So I'm going to go to this question and maybe my question will come back. Okay. Um, so the question in here is with your female clients, how do you handle transparency? Because you're, you're a good looking guy. So I'm sure it has happened. 
um, mm -hmm. whether you're aware or not. So how do you handle that? Um, I mean, really at the beginning of a therapeutic relationship, um, I mean, we both feel energy. I mean, I'm still human. So um, uh, ethically, if there's any sexual attraction that I would have to a potential client, then I am automatically assumed to transfer that client to someone else. Um, that's on my end. Uh, if a client is sexually attracted to me or find me attractive or anything like that, I discuss boundaries. Um, how far this therapeutic relationship goes. You know, there's no calling me after the session if it doesn't deal with your mental health or it's a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. There's no of me, you know, coming to your home after hours and doing Netflix and chilling. That <laughs> can't happen. Um, and there, there, you know, there's a code of ethics that I must live by. And I've always said, I'm not going to break that code you know, to break a code, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to do that to, to lose my livelihood. Um, no relationship in a sense um, that stems from a professional relationship or a therapeutic relationship into a personal one is not, you know, valued that much for me to lose my license over it. So um, let's establish some boundaries at the beginning of, of the relationship, especially if I noticed that there's you know some flirting going on from that end or something like that. Just being able to check that early and you know allow the the client to know that it's purely professional. I care for you and I'm empathetic of your situation, and because I'm giving and I'm recognizing your pain or your hurt or whatever it is that you're dealing with, doesn't mean that I see you in a sexual way. Right. Very good. Very good. And I like the way you you explain that. Um, Definitely setting boundaries is really important um, in a therapeutic relationship. Um, mm -hmm. Not only builds trust, but also rebuilds, builds respect right. um, as well. So yes, thank you for answering that. Um, yeah. Just trying to make sure I didn't have another question. Okay, so with you being a therapist, have you found that being a therapist helps you personally in your, in your intimate relationships or your personal relationships? It does, um, to, to a certain extent. Um, of course, I, I've gotten it before, like, don't use that therapy stuff on me when we're having a you know, <laughs> conversation or we're about to have an argument or a disagreement or something like that. Don't use the therapy <laughs> stuff on me. I'm not your client. You know, that type of thing. But from a personal standpoint, um, it definitely, you know, made me self-aware over the years, um, more self-aware and aligning with my, my, my own self um, and doing the necessary things to take care of my own mental health. Just because just because I'm a therapist don't mean that I don't have issues like anyone else. It's just that I, you know, have the coping skills and the strategies to use in order to maintain those things. Or when I feel like I'm out of whack, you know, I know how to get back to some type of quote unquote balance, whatever right. that is. Um, right. So it, it's, it, it definitely helps me personally in relationships, you know, it allows me to, you know, definitely be, be more vulnerable and transparent, you know, as far as my communication, my emotions, how I'm feeling, you know, and, and understanding that it's important to not only to communicate, but also comprehend, you know, what the other person is saying and what they're, you know, understanding from me as well. Right, right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good thing. I, I have noticed, because um, I have always suffered with depression for as long as I can remember. Um, and so has my mother. And so it's, it's been something that I pretty much grew up with, either whether in the household or whether dealing with myself. And I remember my mom saying, when I told her what I was going to school for, she was like, how are you gonna be a counselor when <laughs> you suffer from depression? And I was like, well, being a counselor or a therapist, that doesn't mean that I'm perfect. Right. But one thing, I will learn through my education and my training mm -hmm. is the coping skills that I need and self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And I have noticed a change in, you know, going to school and, um, you know, doing, you know, a lot of mock things and right. research. I've learned a lot about myself 
Right. Um, I've become very, very self-aware. And I think that it definitely has helped when it comes to my relationships, whether it's with my kids or with my mom or other people. Um, and just being able to just recognize things um, that might not have been as clear before. Right. But my training and my education, now those things are clear. So I think it, it definitely gives me, a. actually, I think it gives me a better perspective Mm-hmm. as a therapist, knowing that I've dealt with it before and the coping skills and tools and so forth that I've used. So, um, yeah. yeah. So does, are you the guy that all your friends go to when they have problems? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I, I, feel, <laughs> I feel that. Yes, I feel <laughs> like that. Um, but, but there's also, again, there, there's boundaries in that. But I mean, it's just the human aspect to know that your friend is a therapist, yeah, that he's easily accessible. And right. oftentimes, if I kind of have this spidey sense that you're calling me about something, I have to determine whether I can take that on at that moment. Right. You know, so setting boundaries for myself and not trying to be, you know, Superman and try to help everyone that's in something or dealing with something or relationship issues or you know, whatever the case may be, um, yeah. because I'm not everybody's therapist, you know, um, hell, I, you know, ther- therapists need their own therapist. So, you know, you're going to continue to go to therapy as well, even though w- once you become a therapist, we, we got to keep that. That's part of self-care. Um, right. So part of self-care for me is being able to say, no, I, I can't take that on right now. Mm-hmm. You know, you get that text message. Hey, can you talk for a minute? That type thing. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Oh, I'll just ignore it, leave it on red, something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Oh, I'm giving out all my secrets, man. <laughs> watching this. Like, but they know, but they know though. Like, yeah. I, I will I will disconnect. That's part of my self-care that I disconnect. If my phone dies, it dies. I don't rush to go charge it back up. Yeah. You know, that's part of me maintaining my own self-care. Like sometimes you do have to disconnect because you know, p- people are emotionally draining. You know, humans are draining. So, so understanding that for me, because I am an introvert and I feel, you know, I, I dispel a lot of energy, you know, when, when I'm working with consumers, I have to be able to decompress and kind of build my own energy back up. So if everybody's pulling at me, you know, I'm, I'm no good for anyone when I'm on E, right. you know what I mean? Right. So I make sure that I, that I practice my self-care on a daily basis. I do my, my morning meditation. I do it at night as well so I, I try to make sure that 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 i stay, stay aligned and when i'm out of balance then i just check out you know right. I, i'm gonna do something for myself definitely thank you for bringing that up because i was gonna talk about self-care but you pointed on it already um how you know just disconnecting um knowing when to say no um i see that you know you, you look like you're 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 pretty fit so i'm assuming that you might do some exercising or no <laughs> That, that's that's genetics. This is all, okay. you know, um, and a high metabolism. Gotcha. That's, okay. I, I haven't smelt a gym in months, and this is before <laughs> the quarantine. Like I, I, I'll do it every day, but no, like if I had to no. run on a track right now, I will pass out in one lap. <laughs> pass out so no don't don't get, don't, don't, don't get put that there okay okay no, okay no, well just... you definitely know the importance of self-care you you have expressed that and um mm-hmm. and we have been um not only do i uh work with the speak of an inspire series but i also have my organization butterfly visions project and our theme for the year is self-care mm-hmm. um so i'm really glad you brought that up and i definitely was going to bring it up so i'm glad that you did mm-hmm. so Otherwise, than your your daily routine of meditation, how do you avoid burnout? Because you are taking on a lot of issues from a lot of people. How do you avoid burnout? Um, hmm. I'm not gonna say that I avoid burnout because I do get burnt out. It's just identifying what's important at that time, um, and sometimes it's going to be unbalanced. Sometimes I'm going to overwork um, or do things that I create, you know, whether that's my platform on the couch 704 or whatever the case may be, sometimes it's going to be a little bit more than less. So just being able to 
and I had this conversation with another colleague of mine. She was on my show, um, Miss Kimmy Huntley. She's called a self care bell. So she was saying um, that you have to practice grace within yourself. Give yourself grace if if you don't complete something. You know that you feel like you need to do that particular day, but you were just so overworked or you felt drained. Give yourself grace and say, okay, you know. We, we will try to tackle that tomorrow. So being able to try to sustain some type of balance within that and just say, you know what, I'm not perfect. I wasn't able to do it today. I did X, Y, Z, so I'm grateful for that. Or, you know what I mean? So just being able to say, you know what, I'm human. I can't be Superman or Superwoman all the time. I need a break. I need a hiatus. I need to get away. I need to, I need to go to sleep. Right. You know, all those different things. So, you yeah. know, we just have to be able to practice that and be able to say, like, it's okay. You yeah. know, that I didn't get everything that I needed to get done today. Yes, there's obviously there's not enough hours in a day for us to get done everything we want right. to get done. So no, you have to right. know when to say, okay, that's it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Got it. Got it. You have a couple more questions. Um, so one of them is, what field of mental health do you feel you do your best work in? What field or as far as like population? Um, I'm going to assume, I'll let like you answer how you feel you want to answer. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that's what they're, what they're asking is what type mm -hmm. of client per se. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely mood disorders. Um, I do a lot of work with trauma uh, and understanding what trauma is and what it looks like and what, you know, anxiety and depression looks like and being able to kind of explore different ways to kind of reduce those symptoms associated with that. I've been getting a lot of individuals that suffer from trauma. Um, yes. And it's not like it's new. Um, this is something that we, especially as African-Americans have dealt with for, for centuries. And now it's coming to the forefront and it comes out, you know, in our behavior and how we interact with each other and you know, it goes all the way to the legal system and political, you know what I mean? Substance mm -hmm. abuse, all these things that we lead in, you know, health disparities, all these things are effects of trauma, you right. know, internalizing things for years and years. And genetics has been proven that it's passed down, you know, through right. genetics. So understanding those things and being able to address that, you know, was one of the key things that I that I kind of honed in on, you know, over the years. I kind of that's how I kind of developed my my niche. I just I just went there. I guess I started to see more people that suffered from, you know, depression and anxiety. And then once you really get into it, then they say, Oh yeah, I was molested when I was seven years old. Or mm -hmm. I've been raped three or four times, and I can't keep a healthy relationship. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm broken you know, things like that. So things start to come out as we start to do a little bit more digging. Yes, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, as a world right now, we are going through a lot um, there. And I, on Friday, one of the men said something very, very important. He said that all, most, I don't believe he said all, but he said most black people have experienced some form of trauma, whether it's family related, environmental, or just dealing with racism, and yeah. it has not been dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was a good point that he made on on Friday. Um, right. What are your What are your thoughts on that? I can definitely agree with that. I can definitely see where where he was taking that. Um, I've said before. I, I mean, I say it all the time. Like we all come from a certain level of dysfunction you yeah. know we're from just from our ancestors and from just generational trauma we all have some type of dysfunction within our family and it's mm -hmm. not always the severe cases as far as being molested or being physically abused but a lot of things that have been passed down you know taught from their great-grandparents to grandparents to parents to us you know, some of those things are just dysfunctional thoughts, you know, mm -hmm. and we can be emotionally abusive to each other and not even realize it. You know, we don't have to touch each other or, or been whipped with, you know, chains or anything like that or be beaten with a bat or a broom, 
growing mm. up, you know, which I did experience that. Like, rest in peace, my mom, but she hit me with everything. <laughs> but <laughs> sorry, sorry. race car tracks, you know what I mean? All that. So, but but, but we we've all experienced some type of dysfunction, um, which leads to like how again how we interact with each other and how we, you know, pass those things down subconsciously through our offspring, you know, and you know, we wonder why, you know, our younger kids are now experiencing more depression and, and more anxiety and like, you know, you're, you're too young to be this worried about things and right. they, they're, they're sponges. So they're soaking up all this information, both positive and negative. And as humans, I mean, as far as adults, like we can maybe handle it a little bit better mm-hmm. in a sense, we can still maybe operate during the day to day, but kids, I mean, they can't. And now they're being diagnosed with ADHD and ODD when mm-hmm. in actuality, it may be something related to trauma or depression or anxiety in a sense. So, you know, just being able to understand that is, is really important for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have two other questions related to um, mental health and then we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Okay. Um, so the other question was, are you for therapy or medication management? Do you, you feel that one is more helpful mm. than the other or mm. what, would, what would be the response to that? Um, since we're not in a therapy session, uh, I, I guess my bias would be therapy. Um, medication, in a sense, it alters the way that you view something. I mean, it's a mind altering substance. Mm-hmm. So my thing is if it's too severe or if it's very severe to the point to where you're harm to yourself or to others potentially and there's a a quick need to address it then definitely medication can be useful um i would always say if you're taking medications for any type of mental health disorder you need therapy as well because you need to be able to learn how to live without taking that medication It's just like somebody with high blood pressure or diabetes. Like you don't want to take insulin for the rest of your life. So you would change your lifestyle. You would change your diet. You would exercise more. You would do all those necessary things to get rid of the medication. So why not do the same thing for your mental health? Those things should coincide with each other just as much as we get physical health checkups every year or biannually you get your checkups and make sure everything is good with your body. I feel feel like everyone should get a mental health checkup at least twice a year just to check in and make sure everything is good from a mental perspective as well. I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, For me, I think um, when I become a a therapist, I'm definitely going to be into mindfulness and, you know, holistic approaches and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not a a big advocate of medication for personal reasons, Mm -hmm. Um, but I do know that there is a necessity at some point right. for some people that they might right. need it. Right. Um, so I totally agree. I totally agree with that perspective. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree that the holistic approach would be the right way to go. So definitely, you know, Google different things. Uh, the information is there. They may not want you to, to see it, but there's a lot of different holistic practices and approaches that you can utilize in order to, you know, reduce symptoms associated with, with whatever diagnosis, um, especially if it's depression or anxiety, you know, a lot of these things are, are thought processes. So therapy is more helpful than anything, but if you do need medication, like I said, there needs to be a combination uh, of both of those. You can't have one without the other. You know, if yes. you need medication, you need to have therapy as well. Because I always say, if, if you can't get a refill or that medication is discontinued or you know, medication is no longer available, what do you do? You know, so make make sure that you have the, the, the necessary tools in order to address your symptoms without medication. So we're not on it. You know, we're just yeah. so used to getting on medication because we want these quick fixes and that's mm-hmm. just society driven. We just want everything like right then, right now. Right. Um, but mental health and, you know, doing the mental health exercise, um, it, it's a process. You know, just like losing weight. I mean, you know, it's a process. You can get a quick fix, but <laughs> if, if you don't change your eating habits, you're going to be right back getting out the curves. You know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> getting your Brazilian butt lift and you know what I'm saying, everything <laughs> else. So, you know, why yeah. not just do what you need to do, you know, from the right. will, you know what I mean, right. um, to, to correct those things. Totally agree. Totally agree with that. Um, the last question um, related to um, mental health is what do you, what is your best advice for someone who's seeking a mental health professional? Best advice. Um, first things first, the fact that you're seeking advice from a mental health professional, that's the best thing. Um, if you ever have to question yourself, should you go to therapy? That means you need to be in therapy. If you ever have to question that, um, also every therapist is different. You know, uh, we're, we're humans just like anyone else. So just because it doesn't work the first time or that therapist didn't fit, doesn't mean that all therapists are not going to fit. We're all different and make sure that you find someone that is culturally competent. It doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that they have to be black, white or whatever, but one, you have to be comfortable with that person because you that's a vulnerable space and that's a trusting space. So you have to be able to build, you know, a healthy therapeutic relationship with any therapist that you, you know, talk to, but also they have to somewhat understand or at least be aware of what your issues are. Um, we often struggle right now uh, within mental health with, you know, certain clinicians and practitioners not being culturally competent. So now you're being misdiagnosed in a sense and you're getting the wrong treatment measures. You, you may be getting a particular medication that you don't even need, mm -hmm. you know, or a particular treatment approach that you don't necessarily um, can kind of relate to. So, you know, one being culturally competent, also being, being able to be open and honest. Like if you're gonna go to therapy, just be, be honest. That's like the worst thing that you can do is go to therapy and lie. Like you can probably go ahead and be honest and tell me everything. It's not going anywhere. You know, it's a judgment-free zone. Um, so just be prepared to be vulnerable. If you need to cry, cry. If you want to be pissed off, be pissed off. But be prepared to be vulnerable and trust that, that person has your best interest at heart. And you're just not a copay or yeah. a dollar amount. You know what I mean? Yes, totally agree. Um, I am very big on interviewing the therapist um, okay. before you make a decision. Um, yeah, absolutely. Not yeah. everybody's for everybody. <laughs> we ask a whole bunch of questions as therapists. So yeah, definitely ask questions. Get to know your therapist. You know, you may, they may not give you like deep, dark secrets or something like mm -hmm. that, but at least know a little something about you know, their direction, what their goals are as far as therapy in a sense, what type of therapy they utilize, all mm -hmm. of those different things like interview your therapist. Yes, yes, very true, very true. Okay, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Okay. Okay, so um, hopefully this question will lead into it, but I'm pretty sure it will. Um, being a black man and mm -hmm. being a black therapist, have you noticed that you maybe lose white clients because you're black or maybe because you're black and you're tatted or have you experienced racism as a therapist? Um, I think before I was a therapist working in the community, um, I actually used to work in Gaston County. So there, there's, you know, certain sides or certain areas of Gaston County that you may not want to visit at nighttime if you're a black guy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I was one of those dudes that I, I don't think I experienced it like face to face in the sense as far as clients, because once I started working with them and I'm just being myself, you know, it, it was okay. You know, they'll say, well, you're, you're the only black person that, you know, we allow out here because you're just so great or, you know what I mean? Like you're a cool dude or whatever, but we normally wouldn't allow any black people out here, that type thing. But I've never experienced like, this face-to-face, this blatant racism, you know, just in my face to where I felt offended or threatened or anything like that. Um, I don't know if it was because I was tatted up and it was like, <laughs> okay, this, I don't know what he's going to do because he looks kind of scary or something like that. But um, I think it was more of a community thing, more so than an individualistic um, thing with my clients, you know, right now currently they seek me out you know mm -hmm. like they're, they're choosing me 
in a sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not choosing them, you know. Um, right. So it's a little bit easier. And I mean, I, I get Caucasian clients like all the time, male, female. Um, sometimes you just need a different perspective. And, you know, when they see me and, they, and we actually converse and we actually get to know each other and we talk, you know, they, they realize that, you know, we're not too different. You know, there, there are similarities in, in all of us. And I think that's just how we need to see the world. Like, although we're different, you know, we're, we're the same. We have the same fears. We have the same things that piss us off. We have the same, you know, whatever. Um, so once they're able to like sit down and talk with me, interview me and talk to me, like we're good. But there are some people I would say like, nah, I'm not gonna take that person. So I had that choice to whether I accept them or not in a sense, right. Right? right? But but more often than not, like as a therapist, I haven't really encountered a client, you know, being racist towards me. Yeah. Right. That was a good right. question though. I've never been asked that. <laughs> Well, good. <laughs> um, okay, so this past weekend, there was tragedy right here in Charlotte, and um, we both, well, I'm in Annapolis now, but um, was living in Charlotte for several years. I know that you're living in Charlotte. Um, we just had this horrific shooting that happened yesterday mm. um, off of Beatty's Ford Road. Um, yeah. How do you feel about I mean, there's a normal feeling, but you know, yeah, yeah. What are your, what are your thoughts? It, I was, I was hurt in a sense of, like, I'm, I'm that dude that I don't like to look at videos that can be traumatic in a sense, like whether that was, you know, George Floyd's video, never watched it, um, anyone but before that. You know, I, I've never really watched videos because I know how it impacts me. You know, I get, I'll get pissed off. I'll get angry. I'll, I'll be hurt at the same time. And, you know, I, I actually posted something maybe a couple of weeks ago when the whole George Floyd thing happened. You know, I started to feel numb. You know, um, this one, I didn't necessarily feel numb. I, I was pissed off um, hearing about it. Um, Somebody sent me the video and I watched about a couple of seconds of it. Like I skipped to like all the stuff and mm -hmm. just to see people laying out there and people like just running like, you know, like growing up in the hood when you turn the lights on in the kitchen and all the roaches scattering everything, mm -hmm. that's what it looked like, you know? And it's not to say that I hadn't experienced that before. Like I've seen that growing up where I'm from, like there have been shootouts and you know people popping in the air and people just scatter but the point of, the point of it you know being targeted you know anyone was a target at that point and you know innocent bystanders being hit for for whatever reason we still don't know and we probably will never know you know who the suspects were it was just you know it was uncalled for i, I don't want to say it was us i don't want to say it was the police i don't i'm I am a conspiracy therapist, but I'm not going to put that out there like yeah. <laughs> right now because I don't want them hunting me down. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it was very disheartening, you know, um, to see that happening when we we're just celebrating our independence on Juneteenth. You know what I mean? So for that yeah. to happen, and this happened all across the country over this weekend. So, you know, my, my prayers and my condolences to the families that lost someone or have you been personally affected or even vicariously affected by this, you know, I'm definitely, you know, thinking about you guys and praying for you guys. Cause I mean, that's trauma. Even if we wasn't directly there, that's vicarious and secondary trauma that we experience. We experience that far too often and it impacts us on an emotional level. So, um, you know, make sure that you guys are maintaining your, your mental health and, you know, putting the phone down, not looking at everything and not digesting everything because it affects you. It affects you. So, um, but yeah, it, it was one of those things like, wow, you know, to hear the gunshots and people screaming and, you know, all of that, it was, it was, it was like a war zone. Like somebody was playing a video game. That's what it sounded like. That's what it sounded like. And it was just, you know, I was, all I could do was shake my head, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, um, it was it was very hard to watch. Um, I tried not to watch too much of videos because just seeing someone shot just 
shakes me to my core. Mm -hmm. But um, because I know two people that are from the Ford, I I felt compelled to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and I did. And it was just, uh, it, it was very hard to watch. Um, definitely traumatic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it really, I don't want to say it opened my eyes even wider, but it did because that's not very far from us. Right. Um, and um, just knowing that I have friends that live on, on the Ford, I think it, it touched me a little bit differently. Um, so, yeah. Are you how are you talking to or are you are you talking to your kids about what's the state of the world right now? Um, I have young ones, so the, the comprehension level um, is still kind of not all the way there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I talk to my son, you know, because he's a young black man and, you know, because he has certain disabilities in a sense, um, he's not really conscious okay. in, in a sense to kind of understand, okay, like you can't just do X, Y, Z, you know, mm -hmm. but, but he knows certain things. He just don't understand why. Right. You know, right. and that's a lot of a lot of kids. I mean, they may know, but they may not know the, the reasoning behind it or, mm -hmm. or at least able to grasp why they're unable to do certain things or, you know, walk down the street with, with a hoodie on, you know, carrying, you know, a nice tea and some skills or something like that. You know what I mean? Or how do you, how not to respond to a police officer when you're pulled over for no reason or you know, things like that. So uh, fortunately, I haven't had to have those conversations yet, but they're definitely coming. They'll be ongoing and consistent in a sense until whenever. But yeah. I don't think it's going to change. So we're going to have to continue these conversations all the time. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I'm having those conversations with my, that my kids, they're 12 years old, so they are aware because of course they're on YouTube and TikTok and <laughs> all that kind of stuff so they're seeing right. things right. so these are hard conversations that I, I it's kind of hard for me to have just not really having blatant or experienced blatant racism against myself right. um but yeah it, it's really hard conversations and um yeah it, it's, it's conversations that not only us as minorities or multiracial like my family is but even Caucasians and right. other races are having these conversations. Um, someone uh, told me the other day, yeah, someone told me the other day that they were having a corporate meeting and it was supposed they had an agenda. And all of a sudden, the leader of the meeting said, you know what, we're not gonna, we're not having our agenda today. Let's talk about racism. And this was a white woman that said, you know what, I need y'all to talk to me about how y'all are feeling right now. Right. And they had a very open conversation and, and the person that was telling me about it, he said that she actually, he said, I sincerely feel that she finally saw what we as black people in this corp, this corporation right. are dealing with. And he said, he, he said, and he, she even cried. And oh. he said, those are the conversations that need to be had and the fact that a Caucasian woman who's never probably experienced racism and probably has never mm -hmm. been affected by racism, right. Right. probably never paid attention to racism because she didn't have to, is, now, is now paying attention. So um, yeah, now um, we are at our time, but I cannot go away without bringing up the fact that, well, there's two things. One, that painting in the back of you is dope. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate it. I need to know who did that for you. <laughs> uh, it's actually uh, Piro uh, Collections. Uh, it's my homeboy, Pedro Omar. Um, okay. Definitely shout out to Pedro. I appreciate the good look on that. He's an artist. Known him since high school. He's always uh -huh. done dope work. You know, okay. has his own own business down there in the Anderson Greenville area. So definitely look him up on Facebook, Pedro Omer, as well as Instagram, if I'm not mistaken. But that's a that's an official hero I see. collection I see a sign right here. And everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Huge shout out. I, I definitely appreciate it. And I'll, I'll be definitely getting more. So any artists yeah. out there, I, I, I like to collect different stuff, especially black power, like I black love it. type stuff. I got things all over you know, my man mm -hmm. cave. So 
a, I see, a I see. I love that right there. So yes, please tag him in the, the comments so I can see his work because that's, I love it. It's beautiful, yeah. colorful, very strong statement. And uh, yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And we can't end without you telling us you are a podcaster yourself. Yes. So tell us about your podcast. And you said, you told me earlier that you have something that you want to do on Wednesday. So tell us about your podcast, what it is, and what are you doing on Wednesday? Uh, podcast, our radio show, um, it's called The Couch 704, for you guys that don't know. Um, we talk any and everything mental health from from trauma to relationships to sex to porn. You know, we talk about everything. It's a, it's a relaxed, fun environment. I, I see you looking to... <laughs> oh, sorry. No. But, but no, I mean, but but conversations, I mean, that, that we need to have regarding, you know, all facets within our life because everything that we do uh, regards and surrounds our mental health. So we talk from anything from addiction all the way to again sex and everything in between um so that's that's <laughs> weekly it's streaming on you know facebook i do igtv youtube um just search the couch 704 you can find us at you know all those platforms as well as your favorite podcast platform spotify you know all of that so you can just go to our website couch704.com um and find all your information there um okay. And two, Wednesday. So Wednesday, like, I've been doing, I've been recording, you know, the couch, and then I'll just put it out every week. Um, and for this week, I'm actually going to do a live um, because I want to I check the temperature of Charlotte, see how we're doing out here, how we're responding to, you know, the pandemic, how we're dealing with the protests, how we're dealing with this shooting that happened last night. And I... I'm, I'm going to open up the live so people can actually be guests. You don't have to be a professional. You don't have to be anything, but I want you to be transparent and talk about, okay. you know, what it is that you're talking about. Don't, don't come on my live talking about at the police. And all <laughs> stuff. Please, like, don't. Don't, Please don't. Don't, don't get me shut down. But, okay. but I definitely want to have some honest conversations, you know what I'm saying, with, with, with my Charlotte people or anybody that's being affected by this stuff right now because it's, you know, it's all over the country. We had mass shootings throughout this entire weekend so you know I, I got people all over so definitely i'm doing doing that wednesday night at 8 p.m i'm just gonna go live and we're just gonna go unscripted we're gonna i'm gonna have some special guests that may chime in you never know okay. who's gonna be there um on the live so make sure you guys <laughs> tune in make sure you guys tune in we're gonna have a good time we're gonna talk and we're gonna, we're gonna discuss some things but but as always on the couch, like we, we, we make it fun. We, we want to laugh. You know, laughter is the best medicine that you get. Um, so we, we try to make it funny. I try to make you laugh a little bit, even though my voice is kind of monotone and it's really low and everything. But we like to have fun, though. That's just what, <laughs> that's just what we do. That's what my couch family does. That's what they, that's what they look for. So Wednesday, 8 p.m., that's what I'm going to do. We're going to invite some people on the couch virtually. And they just gonna pop in, say what they need to say. We have a conversation about it, okay. and that's it. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Fun. Nice. Nice. It sounds fun, um, but also sounds educational. It sounds like it will mm -hmm. be a good moment for people to just decompress and get some things yes. off the mind respectfully. Right. Um, right. So, so yeah, definitely looking forward to that. The Couch Seven Hundred Four. So tell us, how can we find Couch Seven Hundred Four, and how can we? Um, find you if anyone's interested um because people are asking questions so you yeah, sparked some sure. interest in people so how can they find find you and how can they find your um your radio show um cow704.com like i said all the, all the major social medias you know instagram facebook snapchat twitter um youtube um anchor google podcast spotify everything is the cow704 so if you google that you'll be able to find pretty much any and everything regarding the Cal 704. Um, you can find me on uh, my personal website is Damien Harmon. That's my actual government name, <laughs> Harmon.com. Um, you can find me on Facebook at Damien, that's D-A-M-E-O-N dash D-A-S-H. Those are just two nicknames that I kind of combine together, you guys. So my, 
My last name is not Dash. I've had people call my office. <laughs> it's not Dash. It's it's Harmon. Um, so Facebook, Instagram. Um, I don't I don't necessarily do the other ones. I just have Facebook and Instagram. Um, but okay. it's Damien underscore Dash or Not Your Average Therapist on IG. I just recently changed it to Not Your Average Therapist. Yes, I saw not that your, today. Yeah, Not Your Average underscore Therapist on IG. Um, but I like it. <laughs> again, you can find me at, you know, DamienHarmon.com. I have all my personal pages on there as well as on the Couch704.com. Um, everything is there. It's real easy. Yes. yes. Well, I hope that um, being that self-care is the, the theme for Butterfly Visions Project, thus the theme for um, the Speak of Inspire series, I hope that we will be able to invite you on. We want to do, um, we've already uh, interviewed a counselor before, and we want to continue doing this. Um, I think it's very important for us to um, raise more awareness about mental health, especially uh, uh, among minorities, but especially in the state of the world we're in right now. I yeah. think people need it now more than ever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really, really, truly appreciate you for the work that you do. Um, it is needed. Yeah. Um, and it's important and it's something that I hope and wish for more and more people. And I told someone the other day, even if you feel healthy and happy, there is still benefit to seeing a therapist. There's still yes. benefits to taking care of your, your mental health even more than you already are. Just right. because you're happy doesn't mean that there's no benefit. So, um, yes. so yes. So yes, so thank you very much, Mr. Damien, um, for being on tonight. Looking forward to seeing your live on this Wednesday at yes. 8 p.m. on the Couch 704. Mm. And thank you for your time. I really appreciate that. Um, I consider thank you a friend you. and I'm really yes. glad to have you here on the Speak Up and Inspire series. So thank you so much for your time. We did go over a little bit, but I don't think anybody minds. <laughs> <laughs> um, you had a lot of interaction tonight on the post. So yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not go back and check it out because I, I, yeah. I didn't have my my screen up so i'm gonna go back so if y'all yeah. tag me or mention my name i'll go back and and respond we'll do we'll do make sure you tag that artist so everybody knows who he is um because yes. from what i see he's phenomenal um you did have maybe one question i missed so um please check that out as well so okay. thank you have a great night i appreciate right, you y'all be easy out there take care of yourself mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Good night. All right. Have a good one.